looks upon me as I struggle along. They say I have nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart, I'm rejoicing. How I wish they could see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. And there's food on my table. And shoes on my feet And you gave me your love, Lord And a fine family Thank you, Lord For your blessings on me I know I'm not wealthy and these clothes, they're not new. I don't have much money, but Lord, I have you. And to me, that's all that matters. How I wish they could see. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me, I've a good place to sleep. And there's food on my table, and shoes on my feet. And you gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. For your blessings on me. Thank you. God is so good to us all the time. And uh, don't ever, don't ever feel ashamed to thank Him for the least little thing. Because I'll tell you, you uh, we live in a modern technical age where whether we want to or not, most of us live by a cell phone or an email or a text. And uh, we have all these grand plans and one little text or one little phone call changes everything. And so we, when, we, when the Lord lets us do something, we ought to be thankful for it. Think, listen to her sing that song and we talk about how good God is to us you know when we go to the table we thank the Lord for the food but when was the last time we thanked him for the table or the plates or the forks or the napkin to wipe your mouth with and uh, you know we ought to thank the Lord for providing the food for us we ought to thank the Lord for the one that prepared it for us to eat and uh, just the Bible says in all things, you know, we're in all things we're to give thanks. We're to be thankful people. You know, I believe the Bible teaches us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 when uh, the Bible says that in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I don't believe you can be in the will of God and not be a thankful person. I really don't. I believe, and the, I believe the Bible backs that thing. Revelation chapter 4 tonight in your Bible. Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to try to cover some ground tonight uh, out of the fourth and the fifth chapters of the book of Revelation. I enjoy this very, very much. I enjoy the book of Revelation. I've heard several comments uh, from many of you that you're enjoying this as well. And I think it's just very timely for us to look at this now. And uh, it's not something that we would study all the time but from time to time we do need to look at this great book and see what it has to say uh, to you and I as a born again believer now before we get into what will be the third and final 
and of course the largest section of the book of Revelation, let's understand that we're entering here in chapter 4 and verse number 1 into a, a prophecy of events that have not yet taken place. We're getting into Scripture, there's Scripture in the Old Testament that is prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. There's Scripture in the Old Testament that's being fulfilled and has been fulfilled in our generation. And uh, there are Scriptures, uh, of course, in the New Testament, prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ, prophecies of the Apostle Paul, and of course the prophecy here of the Apostle John while he was on the Isle of Patmos, about the end times. Now, knowing that what we're about to read tonight and look at tonight from here for the rest of the time we're in the book of Revelation are things that have not taken place. And that excites me. And I'll tell you why it excites me. It's because I don't believe it's a thousand years down the road or a hundred years down the road, or even fifty years down the road, I don't know when Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 will start, but I do know this much, it could be at any moment. The beginning of the ending could start at any moment. I've been asked before, do you think we're at the end? Well, I don't know. I I don't know. I know that we're not at the end of all things. But I believe we're very, very close to the beginning of the end. We have been, according to the Bible, in last days for 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul wrote about those last days and how things would be upon planet Earth during those last days. And we're there. We're there. I, I worked on a message uh, most of the day today for uh, this coming Sunday night, Lord willing, and uh, did a lot of that reading again in Second Timothy. And uh, so tonight, uh, as we begin Revelation chapter 4, uh, we must remember like the words of the old song that the choir sings every now and again, And I believe it was last year, it was our camp meeting theme, it could happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It could happen in a moment, he could split the eastern sky. Though our hearts will feel unworthy, I'm telling you what's the truth, it could happen in a moment, Jesus Christ could come again. Now, as we finished up last week, chapter 3, we went all the way through the end of chapter 3, we saw Jesus standing outside the church, in the Laodicean period, when chapter 3 closes, the the, the church age closes. When chapter 3 closes, the day of grace is over. And chapter 4, verse 1, is the beginning of the fulfillment of chapter 1, verse 19, when Jesus told John how to write the Revelation. Let's take just do a real quick review. He said, I want you to write the things which thou hast seen. And that was chapter 1 of Revelation. Then he said, I want you to write the things which are, which is chapters 2 and 3, the church age, the day of grace. And then lastly, he said, I want you to write about the things which shall be hereafter. Chapter 4, verse 1 begins, the things which shall be hereafter. Now what we're going to see tonight is we're going to see the rapture of the church by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that ushers in the third of four visions. I told you that in the book of Revelation in its 22 chapters there would be four visions. The first vision was the vision of God in chapter 1. In chapters 2 and 3 we examine the vision of grace. In chapter 4 verse 1 all the way through the end of chapter 20 in verse 15, we will be examining John's vision of government, both divine and earthly. And then, of course, beginning with chapter 21 and 22, will be the final vision, the vision of glory. Not only will we see the rapture of the church tonight, we'll see the judgment seat of Christ. 
we'll see the throne of God and we'll see the preparation for the three series of judgments that the Lord will pour out upon planet earth during the tribulation period after the Lord Jesus comes and takes the redeemed home to be with Him in glory. Now when those three series of judgments are poured out upon the earth, it is because the world has become increasingly wicked and godless and lawlessness has come to a head and God's going to step in and He's going to put an end to it. Just to give you a little sneak preview, if you've studied Revelation before or have read it, you know that the three judgments will begin with the judgment of the seven sealed book. When those judgments are over, over, the seventh seal, when it is open, will actually usher in the next set of judgments, which are seven, and will be the seven trumpet judgments. When the seventh trumpet judgment is concluded, uh, then there will be the third set of seven judgments called the bowl or the vile judgments that God will pour out upon the earth. None of those things we'll look at tonight, but we will look at them in, uh, in future messages, the Lord willing. Tonight, as we begin our study of ver- chapters 4 and 5, uh, John is going to see three unforgettable things. Three things that John saw in these uh, chapters that contained uh, uh, his vision uh, are just unforgettable. First of all, he's going to write to us about an unforgettable throne that he sees. And he's going to describe it in great detail. And then he's going to write about an an unforgettable throng of creatures and people uh, that he'll never forget. And then thirdly and lastly, he's going to write to us about an unforgettable thrill that he got to take part in as the prophecy was given to him and he will get to take part of it in reality someday, just like you and I will. And I know it will thrill your soul. So beginning in chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which shall be hereafter. That's a picture of the rapture. That's a picture of 1 Corinthians 15. That's a picture of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming again and uh, rapturing or snatching us out of the earth. What a great day that's going to be. That's when the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know, when you, when you look through old pictures and you see pictures of loved ones that perhaps you haven't seen in a while, doesn't it make you smile to see their face again and think about one of these days soon I'm going to see them in the cloud and I'm going to see them for real and I'm going to see them alive again and I'm going to see them whole and well. I won't see them like they left this place, but I'll see them in a glorified body just like unto the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll have the same kind of body as they do than the same kind of body that Christ has. It's an exciting, it's an exciting time to think about the rapture when we're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air. Now you know when Paul wrote to the first, to the first letter to the Thessalonians and when he wrote uh, his first letter to the Corinthians and he talked about that rapture in great detail. If you notice, his scriptures pretty much ended when the Lord took us out. Uh, but, but, but the Apostle John got to see more than just us going up in the cloud. He got to see where we were going. And I want you to notice what we're going to get to see when Jesus comes again. Uh, we don't need to worry about being strangers. We're going to be home. We're going to be invited to come home and be with Him just like He invited us to be saved. 
when the Spirit of God touched our heart and convicted us of our sin. Verse number 2, he says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is the throne of God in heaven. I'm about to choke to death. I want you to know that when we get up there, we're not going to just be in a cloud. We're going to a throne. And we're going to see the Lord high and lifted up. And we're going to see that throne. And that throne is going to be unforgettable. And uh, the the Bible tells us here in uh, chapters 4 and chapters 5, John mentions the throne of God 17 times in these two chapters. In chapter 4 it's mentioned 12 times and is uh, viewed as the supreme throne of authority. God's government, God's authority. And then in chapter number 5, uh, we'll see it mentioned five times, and there it is preeminently a throne of grace. Now I want you to notice first of all the mystery of this throne. Now John describes this throne with three uh, different uh, uh, descriptions. The first is that it was, it was to look upon as a jasper stone. Now the jasper stone is a very dense and a very hard stone. It's very hardy. It's it's, uh, for the most part unbreakable, unmovable. And that is a picture uh, of the hardness of God. That He is fixed and He is unmovable and He is unyielding uh, just as His Word is. But, but John not only saw the hardness or the, the, uh, the unyielding of God on the throne, but he also saw that it was a sardine stone. Now a sardine stone is, uh, is a deep, fiery red stone. And it speaks of the holiness of God. And it reminds us that our God, according to Hebrews 12, is a consuming fire. Did you know that over in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 1, the Lord gives an invitation to the sinner through the prophet Isaiah. And He says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now how do red sins become white in the sight of God? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me challenge you to a little experiment. When I first heard this, I tried it, and it's true. You find you a red glass, and you look through that red glass at a red object, and the red object appears white. Now, my friend, I can't explain how that happens, but I can explain how God could take my old red sinful heart and make it white as snow by applying the red blood of Jesus Christ to my old red sin-stained heart. And when the Father looks through the blood of His Son at my sins, they appear white. Hallelujah. And so that sardine stone, that deep fiery red stone uh, of the throne p- speaks of the not the hardness but the holiness of God. And then I want you to notice the third thing he makes mention of is that he saw a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald. Now you and I have a picture in our minds of what a rainbow looks like. It's got five to seven colors in it. That's red, green, uh, blue. Uh, I don't remember all the different colors that's in the rainbow. But uh, that, that's God's promise to never flood the earth again by water or destroy the earth again by water. But when John got caught up in that cloud, he saw a rainbow. And that rainbow was around the throne. Now it's uh, totally different than any rainbow you've ever seen before. Have you ever seen the end of a rainbow? 
I have seen the end of a rainbow one time when we were visiting our daughter and son-in-law in Hawaii. There's rainbows out there every day because it rains every day out there. And we were going down the highway. As a matter of fact, we were going to church. And as we were going to church, there was a rainbow come right across and we were going right past Pearl Harbor. And uh, that rainbow came down and I saw where the rainbow touched the ground. And uh, you could see the house where the rainbow came down and the house was the same color as the rainbow. But you know what? There wasn't no pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. And there wasn't no leprechaun either. But I've seen beautiful, beautiful rainbows. I've seen double rainbows. I've seen triple rainbows. But what I have never seen is a rainbow that is a complete circle. And that's what the rainbow around about the throne of God looks like. It is a complete circle, unbroken in any place. And it is not multicolored. It is the color of an emerald. Now, when we get to that throne, we're we're going to first encounter judgment. I want you to know I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to going home looking forward for Jesus to come. But I want you to understand that when we go there, the first thing we're going to encounter is judgment. Not for our sin. That was paid for by Jesus on the cross. Oh, I was listening to the old sermon again yesterday morning. Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. You've heard that sermon so many times. Oh, Brother Roloff preached that sermon talked about how Dr. Grace gave him a heart transplant and fixed him up and didn't charge him a thing. Now I want you to know that when we get up there, we're going to be judged not for our sin, but we're going to be judged for the works that we have done in His name. And it's going to be a flawless judgment. You won't find any plea bargains at this judgment. You won't find any attorneys making deals behind the door for you to testify against somebody else at the judgment seat. My friend, at that judgment seat, the Bema seat in the Greek, you're going to be standing there all alone. Your pastor won't be able to stand with you and nobody will be able to stand with your pastor. We'll be all alone uh, face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it'll be a formal judgment. The Lord will judge our works whether they were done with the right motive and in the right manner. And it's going to be quite frankly a fearful judgment because there's going to be, uh, our works are going to be tried by fire. Now I don't know exactly how He's going to do that, but I know what the outcome is going to be. Works that we've done, that we've done out of spite. Works that we've done just to get somebody off our back. Work that we done to get make a name for ourselves or to get recognition for ourselves or to get glory for ourselves, those things are going to burn up in the fire. And there will be no rewards given for works that burn up in the fire. Now, works that go through that were done with the right motive and for the glory of God, the Bible says they'll come through as gold and silver and precious stone, and rewards will be given in the form of of golden crowns. Now we notice here in our text uh, that we read that the Bible says in verse number 4 it speaks about this judgment. He says round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. Now you need to understand who those elders are. Those elders are the redeemed. Twelve representations from the Old Testament of those that obtain righteousness by faith and twelve representative of the New Testament. So when we read about these four and twenty elders, we find that that is us, that is the redeemed. Now I want you to notice how we understand that they have come through the judgment seat of Christ. It says that they're sitting clothed in white raiment. White raiment is the righteousness of God for the believer. The righteousness that God requires to enter heaven was bought and paid for on the cross of Calvary and when we were covered in the blood of Jesus Christ we're covered in that white robe of His righteousness that we may be able to stand in the presence of God. But I want you to notice that not only did they have white raiment they had crowns of gold on their head. 
No one else is going to be getting crowns of gold on their head but the redeemed. And no other place will they be given out than at the judgment seat of Christ. Now as we go on down through here, we look and we see that this judgment, uh, this judgment is going to be upon the redeemed. Now then, the Bible tells us what we're going to do with those crowns. If you think, if you think for a second that Jesus Christ is going to give you a crown for your works and you're going to plop that thing on your head and you're going to march all around heaven like that gospel singer come out with that song several years ago and every time he'd go have a concert somewhere he'd have the whole congregation in a conga line following in behind him talking about they's going to march all over heaven with a crown of gold on their head. My friend, that's about as unscriptural as you can get. We're not going to march anywhere with crowns on our head. But if you'll look with me down here in verse number uh, 10, the Bible tells us what we're going to do with those crowns. Now the Bible says the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. My friend, that's what we're going to do. When, when, we, go, when we leave out of here, when the Lord comes, hey boy, after this, after this church age, after this uh, day of grace, uh, Jesus is going to come in the cloud. He's going to call us out. There's going to be a blast of the trumpet, and there's going to be the words, Come up hither! And we're going, to, we're going to understand it. Everybody in their own language is going to understand him saying, come up hither. And we're going to go up there in that cloud and we're going to go and be with our loved ones and we're going to that judgment and our works are going to be tried. And boy, if we have earned any rewards, the Lord Jesus is going to give them to us and it says we're going to be robed in white and have crowns of gold on our head and then something magnificent is going to happen. I want you to notice that in verse number 6, the Bible says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now if you like making marks in your Bible, right there beside verse number 4, write the word cherubim. C-H-E-R-U-B-I-M. Cherubim. Now, these are angelic beings, but they're not just angel messengers. Uh, the cherubim is the group that Satan came out of. He was the leader of the music among the cherubim. They are known for their great strength. They are known if you research them in the Bible. And we, I wish we had time to break all that down, but we don't have time for that tonight in this message. But... They are the ones that record everything in the record of heaven are the cherubim. And the cherubim also have another ministry that we see here in this portion of Scripture. The Bible talks about that these creatures have wings, six wings. And the Bible says that they're full of eyes. And they rest not day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They declare, they cry of the glory and majesty of our God. And the Bible says that when we get up there in heaven, my friend, this is going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you if you're saved. And boy, you ought to be excited about this thing. And boy, when we get up there and we go through that judgment seat of Christ, and we're sitting there and we've had our crowns given to us and we're in our white robes and we're going to hear that bunch take off to praising God. We're going to see them flying around that throne with them six wings and we're going to hear them singing that song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and ever shall be. And that's going to do something to you and me, my friend. It's going to put us on our face before the Lord. And when we get on our 
our face before the Lord, we're going to take them crowns off of our head and realize they don't belong to us. There's nothing we did to get those. It was all because of Christ. And we're going to give those crowns back to Him and we're going to start crying and singing our own song. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and they were created. This unforgettable throng of beasts and people did the apostle John see. So he sees and he hears the cherubim acknowledge the holiness of God to the entire creation. But then in verses 9 to 11 that I just read to you, we see the redeemed acknowledge Him as the highest and the holiness to all of creation. Now we come to chapter 5 and we see the last thing. We see this unforgettable thrill. Now my friend, if being snatched up in a cloud doesn't do it for you, If going before the Lord and receiving a gold crown and a white robe doesn't do it for you. If hearing songs of the majesty and glory of God don't do it for you. Then I want you to look at chapter number 5. I want you to look at chapter number 5. For in chapter number 5 we see the challenge of God is proclaimed to all of creation. Now we've gone through the judgment. We've fallen down before Christ. We've laid our crowns at His feet. And now, now the judgment of God is about to begin to be poured out upon this earth. Now I want you to look in verse number 5, chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of Him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. This is going to be the first set of judgments. Now there was a problem. Maybe there wasn't necessarily a problem, but there was maybe an incompletion here that needed to be completed. And uh, in verse number 2 it says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Uh, Brother Randy, you worthy to open that book? No. David, you worthy to open that book? Man, no. Huh. I'm not worthy to open that book. Junior, you worthy to open that book? Man, no. Man, old John said, I know I'm not worthy. And, and, and it says in verse 3, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look on, look thereon. Oh my goodness, what glory we've just gone through. Being snatched out of the world, (laughs) seeing our loved ones, going before Christ, uh, receiving our crowns and our robe, uh, and singing worship unto Him, and casting our crowns before His feet, uh, and we're ready for it to get going on, and all of a sudden it comes to a screeching halt, because we can't find anybody in heaven worthy to open the book. And John said, I wept. Oh, how I wept because no one was worthy. Paul wasn't worthy. John wasn't worthy. Peter wasn't worthy. D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon wasn't worthy. R.A. Torrey wasn't worthy. They could find no Man, no matter how great on earth, to open that book. And in verse 5, one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. You dry them tears up. He said, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. How did He prevail? He prevailed by giving His life on that cross. He prevailed by going into that tomb for three days and three nights and going into the heart of the earth. And He prevailed because on the third day He got up out of that grave and walked through that rock and ascended back unto the throne of God in heaven and has been ever living to intercede for you and for me. And He's come down here and got us and He's carried us to Himself and He's judged 
judged us and now he steps forth as one that has prevailed and it is Christ that is worthy. Hallelujah. And behold, and I beheld in verse 6, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. As it had been slain, yes, those nail marks are still there. That spear mark is still there. Those, uh, those marks from the crown of thorns are still upon the brow of the lovely Lamb of God. And the Bible says that he came in verse 7 and he took the book out of the right hand, hand of him that saw, sat upon the, book, upon the throne. I'm so excited I can't talk, amen. I got my message, I got my hair cut and now my mouth won't work. Oh, listen to me tonight. Oh, what a thrill it's going to be when you and I and all the redeemed are up there around that throne and we see Jesus Christ step forward and said, I'll take the book for I'm worthy to open the book. And the father hands it right over and said, yes, son, you certainly are worthy to take that book. And the challenge of God is met in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to watch something here. And when he took that book, verse 8, when he took that book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and gold and the uh, golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of the saints and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made unto us our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. I don't care how many calculators you buy, you'll never come up with how many voices and how many people that is. And all of us, all of the beast, all of the redeemed, all of the cherubim, all of the seraphim, all of the angels of glory will say with one loud uh, <coughs> combined voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders found, fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and forever. Christ is praised throughout the creation. We said in chapter 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9, Thou art worthy. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, Thou art worthy. We know why He's worthy. But you want to know who said He was worthy? Well, I want you to know, first of all, the Father said He was worthy. There was a day when Jesus <coughs> come to the age of 30, and He came along, walking along the River Jordan. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus went down into that water, and John baptized Him. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God descended from heaven like a dove and lighted upon him and there was an audible voice came from heaven and it was the voice of the father and he said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased the father said he was worthy but not only did the father say he was worthy but while he was here upon the earth his friends said that he was worthy Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking with those apostles and He says, Who do men uh, say that I the Son of Man am? And they 
gave the description. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you Jeremiah or Isaiah, one of the prophets. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter stood right, stood right up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. His friends said that he was worthy. But you know what? Even his foes said he was worthy. When he stood before Pontius Pilate, Pilate told that crowd, I find no fault in him. His foes said he was worthy. When they put him on that cross, that one thief said, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you get down from the cross and get us down too? And that other criminal said, don't you fear God. We're getting what we deserve. But this man hath done nothing amiss. He said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Even his foes said he was worthy. And my friend, one of these days, real, real soon, I'm going to get to fall down on my face before Jesus twice. Before the tribulation period starts, I'm going to get to fall on my face three times. And twice I'm going to sing to Him, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy. Art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and praise. I'm going to get to do that twice. And then I'm going to get to fall down before Him and lay the crowns. I pray that I can win at that judgment seat for the life that I've lived and lay them at His feet and worship Him. My friend, that is not only an unforgettable throne and an unforgettable throng of beasts and people, but what an unforgettable forgettable thrill it's going to be to be there and to witness that. And we'll be there for all eternity. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, it's so exciting to look into the future, Lord. And we don't look into some old crystal ball like some heathen Lord, we look into the crystal clear Word of God that tells us of these future events. And Lord, we're getting closer every day. And one of these days, Lord, soon, we're going to hear that trumpet. We're going to hear that cry. We're going to hear that shout. And we're going to meet you in the cloud. And oh Lord, we're going to get to live and experience Revelations 4 and 5. So we pray tonight, Lord, that each heart's been touched by this exciting scripture. Lord, may it excite us and thrill us that, Lord, that we will try to be a little bit more like you and live a little bit more in a manner that's lined up with the Word of God and pleasing unto you. So, Lord, we ask now you dismiss us with your grace. Lord, bring us back on the Lord's day if it be thy will. Give each one traveling grace and mercy home. Jesus' name, thank you. Amen.